All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We are here today to discuss challenges facing crypto businesses. So we might lock the doors and everyone can come in for the next 24 hours. We might be able to get through 1% of it. <laughs> um, I'm Tommy Honan. I'm from SwiftX. The, I'm head of product strategy at SwiftX. Um, SwiftX is a crypto exchange, one of the largest in Australia, serving retail clients. Um, we're also here with our podcast, Tapping Into Crypto. Come by the stand later on if you guys want to um, say hello and, and check out a really good resource for you guys to download. Um, I might pass in and introduce the panel members, starting here with um, Liam. Uh, hi, guys. My name's Liam Bussell. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Cloud Tech Group and also Cobweb Pay. Uh, we have a booth there. Um, we're essentially a blockchain services firm. We have a development shop. We have a, a venture capital. Cobweb Pay is a, a payments and digital wallet built on blockchain rails. Hi, I'm Simon Callahan. I'm CEO of Blockchain Australia, the peak industry body. Uh, we, we have a number of members, SwiftX being one, a number of our members here. Uh, we have professional memberships available as well for individuals, but we uh, advocate uh, to government and uh, you know, with regulators and uh, traditional finance and, and, and broadly represent the industry. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think it's afternoon now, actually. Uh, my name's Jamie. I'm representing BitGet. I'm a country manager, helping oversee marketing and operations. Uh, so in some of the English-speaking countries that we have in the organization. As a centralized exchange, we're in the top five for derivatives and spot. And for copy trading, we're very proud to be the number one leading platform. I'm Christy Dapt. I'm also with Blockchain Australia and um, membership manager. So uh, anyone here that um, see me later and uh, help to, to uh, join our community. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gareth Ingham. I look after the emerging and regulated verticals for PayPal in Australia. Uh, just a quick snapshot about us, but we've launched a, a stablecoin in the US. We've got buy, hold, sell in the States, uh, export, import, and transact. In Australia, we're working very closely with exchanges, our kind of first foray into the market. So great to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, guys. I have a couple of key pillars that I want to touch on today. Um, no, 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 none uh, more or less significant than consumer trust. Obviously, it's something that's been damaged quite heavily over the last couple of years. We, we talked about a lot of the high-profile failures in the industry. We're trying to move forward from that. Let's, um, you know, they talk about the rear-view mirror being a lot smaller than the, the front windscreen. So, you know, we are obviously trying to look forward. But I guess I might pass to yourself, Gareth. Where do we start? How do we start to build back that consumer trust? Obviously, great brands like. PayPal coming into the space is a, is, a, is a good tick for the industry overall. Where do we, where do we start, Matt, from your perspective? Yeah, sure. I was just saying before to Christy, but I think the industry's best days are ahead of it. I don't have the doom and gloom lens on the sector. Um, I think a lot of the use cases today are very much focused on trading, but I think the broader opportunity for the sector and opportunities to build trust is around consumer engagement on real life use cases that impact everyday consumers. So our focus is obviously on those use cases. The, the stablecoin was kind of trying to address that. We are looking at metaverse opportunities. We're looking at transactional use cases. Um, but I think a, a big part of it, if you are going to be offering transactional volatile asset kind of trading activity is education. Very clearly in our app in the US, when we talk to customers, and you know, these are often very much first time customers, we, we make sure they understand what they're getting themselves into, that there is you know, ebbs and flows with these asset classes, and that they have you know, a chance of losing their, their money. I also look after real money gambling and uh, derivative trading inside PayPal, and I work with a lot of businesses, and I've seen this kind of story before. I think the education uh, that those businesses have to put in front of customers goes a long way to telling consumers what they're getting themselves in for, um, making sure that people are very well aware of the, the sector, the asset class, that volatility, and then also taking people on that journey so they can, you know, trust is built over time. You don't, you don't lose it straight away, you don't win it straight away. It's doing the right thing consistently and putting customers at the center of your process. If you think about how it could, could go wrong for a customer and try and engineer those processes out, uh, and if it does go wrong, that's your moment of truth. How do you actually bring the customer back to the center of that and try and make them whole or at least get them to a point where they understand what's actually happened and um, build that trust over time and, and get them to engage with the sector in a meaningful way. 
I throw that one to Jamie as well, just from that kind of exchange perspective. Obviously, Garrett's coming at it from a slightly different lens, even though PayPal are doing a lot more in the kind of native crypto space, which is really, really good to see. From the exchange perspective, Jamie, I guess, what do you think we need to do? And I say we, coming from a crypto exchange as well, based in Australia. No, I think Gareth brought up some, some really great points. I think the number one thing to gain trust is, is clearly doing the business that you intend to do, and that's over a period of time. Clearly, at BitGet, we're five years old. We're, we're relatively new, but relatively old within, within the centralised exchange <coughs> space. And I think for us, it's acknowledging and having a conscious awareness of what went wrong in the past and what actually went well in the past. And I think we've took a awful lot from the FTX saga or horrific events that happened uh, and on the back of that we implemented some great strategies and, and some of those is a 300 million dollar protection fund for our users for their, for their assets we also make sure that we're backed and everything is fully transparent in terms of our holdings within our centralized exchange and we pride ourselves on making sure that we are fully transparent in every communication making sure that communication is there with our community and they input our services that we want to deliver i think having faces and having real people attend events like this have conversations is critical even though we saw it in the past with sam bankman and people like this actually being accountable for your actions being able to front up when things aren't right holding your hands up and speaking about it being open because not everybody's perfect especially when it involves finance it's about being transparent and owning up to your mistakes i might throw that one to liam from a slightly different lens again i know liam you've been involved in bringing a number of different types of businesses through regulation and regulated markets i guess from your perspective what's what are the kind of key themes that jump out to you that businesses kind of do wrong in the space as well yeah i mean yeah, what Tommy's referring to is for my sins, I've worked in a couple of different markets and I've taken three uh, blockchain companies through IPO processes. So I've gone from the crazy collab, let's get five million people on our telegram to actually your communications are now regulated. If you're going to pump all your good stuff, you've got to equally give, give some exposure to your bad stuff. You have to be fair and balanced. Um, I think Gareth and, and Jamie have, have really covered the key points, right? I, I think as a crypto business, you essentially have to do the same as a mature, intelligent adult, right? If you make a mistake, you acknowledge it, you accept it, you take accountability and you apologize or do what you have to do, and then you don't make the same mistake going forward. Um, I think to a certain extent in the industry, there's been, uh, to a certain extent, we've failed to regulate ourselves, right? So the next step is regulation from outside and, and bodies like Australian, uh, uh, the Australia Blockchain Club Blockchain Sorry, Australia. I forgot your name. Blockchain, Blockchain Australia. Uh, it's written on a t-shirt if you... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but anyway, th these are good steps, right? If you look at other industries, if you look at the medical industry, the AMA, as a regulatory, uh, as an industry body, usually kicks out bad practicing doctors before they get criminal charges. So that's where we need to be, right? If we police ourselves effectively, then people are going to have trust. There's a, also a real sort of uh, cognitive dissonance in the industry, which is... If we're all making gains, we like to say, oh, regulation is terrible. If it comes, it's going to shut down innovation. As soon as we get wrecked, we run straight to the regulators to try and get recompense. So I think that's going away in the industry. You know, as a marketing guy, what I explain when I work anywhere is I'm good with words and, and I spend a lot of time working on slogans and all that. But if you give me a C minus product, I can make it look like a B plus product for a while, maybe an A minus product. But if the product doesn't improve, I lose my credibility and I'm no longer effective, right? If you have a product and you're improving it, I think communicate that really effectively. Like we're in beta, you know, we know there's bugs, this is our roadmap, this is what we're doing. And if you give milestones to the industry and to your users, like meet those milestones. Don't, don't just BS. There was one more thing that I really wanted to add. And this is something that I'm actually very bullish on and it sounds strange that I'm gonna say this, but corporate responsibility, and we see it within many other sectors, within all walks of business, to be honest. I think that as exchanges, as projects, as individuals, as influencers, whatever you are within this space, you have a responsibility for your actions. We want to see more investment in education, and that's something that we're proud to be doing. And we also want to see the, the language barriers, the barriers of entry being not only removed, but encouraging people to ask the questions that they need to ask. Let me give you an example of that. Right now within the MENA region, the Arabic speaking region, we're rolling out a brand new platform in the Arabic language. And that's something that we didn't do in the past. Why would we do that? Because we want users to understand the product that they're using fully. In the past, they might not have been able to do that. And I think having a conscious awareness of the product that we deliver to people and being able to digest what's in front of them is critical. And we don't want to make mistakes that have been happening in the past. Yeah, can I jump back in, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. But like, let's cut really to the core message. We are taking money from the public 
We have a fiduciary responsibility to be responsible for that money. That does mean that means no commingling of accounts. Mm -hmm. And I understand that's a really big ask, and a lot of crypto companies have problems with banking, so I understand that there's some caveats there. But you're taking money from people, you have to be humble and you have to be responsible. Treasury management is not a well-developed skill in this industry. It's an absolute perfect segue, Liam, I was going to trust to Simon. Obviously, you know, you can talk about challenges facing crypto business and crypto entrepreneurs and investors without talking about some of the restrictions that have been kind of placed across the industry over, even over the last six months. Every second Facebook group talking about investors in crypto are asking about how do I circumnavigate $10,000 a month kind of restrictions and all these things are kind of getting placed at the moment. And I guess my opinion is that's not without reason. There's, there's a really good reason for that and it's being a kind of crypto native myself, it, I don't really enjoy saying that, <laughs> that I'm aligned with it, but it is, the fact of the matter is the, the fraud rates are kind of getting out of hand in a lot of areas and these things need to be curtailed and while the blanket ban approach is, is probably not the one we're going to um, end up with, which I hope, but it's a kind of a starting point and it does stem the, stem the flow. I guess I'm just going to throw it to you, Simon, in terms of, mm. I guess you're, you know, you guys have done some fantastic work at Blockchain Australia to bring the banks in and that's work we, we want to, um, we want to protect as well, you know, because it takes a long time and it has taken a long time to bring that in. I guess from your perspective, what more can we be doing there and, and you know, to, to give the banks and, and these kind of payments companies? Yeah, with, I mean, without giving away too much detail and putting the cart before the horse, I, I mean, I, I'm not here to spruik PayPal, but I, from what I hear, <laughs> allegedly they're a good worker. I am, so I'll happily do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, look, we definitely, I mean, we said it yesterday on our digital economy panel. It, it's it's actually an opportunity for the industry to work with with TradFi. It, it shouldn't be seen as um, an us versus them thing. Like if I was a business yeah. like SwiftX, I'd be licking my lips and I'd be doing everything I could to partner with with the banks so that when this regulation comes into force and people can log into their NAB app or CBA app and um, purchase some crypto. Um, you know, I'd want it to be going through my exchange or through my business or through my payments company. That, so I think it's actually a huge opportunity in terms of volume. Um, I think the wider spread adoption, not just to the crypto natives like the people here in the audience and at this uh, convention, but um, you know, to the broader population. So I think it presents a huge opportunity, bigger than we've probably we've seen before. Uh, we, and we are doing some work, yeah, again, without going into too much detail, like we obviously have conversations with the banks, I, I, I just spoke to one of the largest ones on, on Friday about this particular initiative with Blockchain Australia, we'll be working with the Australian Banking Association to uh, stem the throughput from online scams that occur on, largely on Meta and um, um, somewhat Google ads and uh, also you know, with Telstra and um, text messages and I don't think Optus text messages work anymore. Do <laughs> um, but um, so look, that's the starting point too for soon, online scams. Too soon for that one maybe? Yeah, maybe. No. Um, and, and I think we, no, no, nobody wants to see Australians scammed other than the scammers. Like, mm. The government doesn't want that, the crypto companies, the People in the audience, neither do the banks. Nobody wants to see Australians losing over three billion dollars, reportedly projected to be over four billion dollars a year this year. That's just money lost from our economy, and uh, it could be used for um, purposeful things. That um, the multiplier effect, which grows the economy for everyone. Um, so there are initiatives take that that will be coordinated that will help address it. And I think once we get that in order, and it goes back to your point, uh, you know, if we're going to be mature about things, let's put our hands up and say, yep, we effed up. We're trying to do better. Here's how we're going to go about it. Uh, we'll gain a lot of respect, both from TradFi businesses, from the government, and from the wider public, the people who aren't here today. Uh, and, and I think once we get those things in order, um, these temporary measures, and I've, I've been told by the banks they are temporary, measures uh, on those limits in place. And, and, and I think your point uh, too, Liam, around we, we probably need to do a better job in policing the bad actors. We, we, we definitely do. Yeah. I was just going to, um, I guess, throw that one to Garris as well. I guess from the PayPal lens, it's, you guys obviously work very closely with banks as well, and it's you know, a key ally in, in the, the, um, the space that you guys work in. 
I guess, but how do you guys look at that as potentially an opportunity? I know you guys are going deeper in crypto, if you don't mind me using that term, mm -hmm. um, and in servicing crypto businesses, even in Australia, you've done some work with the likes of Independent Reserve, um, you know, trusted name in the industry here. I guess, how do you guys see that as a you know, potential opportunity as well, if you can speak to that? Yeah, sure. So we, we've seen that, we, we, honestly, we believe that money's going to become digital, and I said that in my talk. It's a question of when, not if. So we want to participate in the economy. Um, let me give you a crash course in payments and finance, though. There's, there's kind of four lenses that businesses in our world have to look at. The first is a legal lens. Is it legally allowed to happen? The second, is there a, a financial risk? Is there a compliance risk? And the final one, is there a brand risk? So when organisations like ours and others that support the network of payments look at the ecosystem, whether it's your vertical or any other emerging vertical, the others that I look at, I've mentioned before, they're kind of the parameters we look at. And we tend to, as an industry, take the highest standard from all the participants in that industry. So Visa or MasterCard, for example, put a, a standard. The industry has to rise to that standard. If a bank or an acquirer puts a standard in, we have to rise to that standard as an industry. So there's a level of governance around that, and I know that can be very frustrating for the industry itself, but I would say and encourage the industry to definitely lean into that process. You mentioned it before, Tommy. It's there for a reason. We don't do it because we want to do it. Generally, businesses want to say yes to business. We're not, we're not trying to turn business away, um, but we're doing it because there's all those judicial responsibilities. We are regulated as industries, and we're trying to make sure that the, the standard is held high. You know, you've mentioned it before. One of the challenges for Australia is getting um, uh, money accounts, you know, regulated money accounts for funds, Liam. So that's a that's a topic that the banks will need to address over time. But you know, I think regulation is going to be a really good thing because it brings in a minimum standard for industry participants to hit. If they choose not to hit those standards, then they'll obviously exit, and that's up to them. But it also gives confidence to the sector that those base level minimums are being maintained across the organisation. They can be audited, checked, validated, and it gives just more confidence. People are more willing to support something they know and trust, um, and we're no different, right? We operate in those same, same walls because we have all the APRES and the ASICs and the OzTracks across our business as well. One for um, Christy specifically, actually. Um, <laughs> Christy, you obviously do a lot of work with a number of clients across blockchain Australia, and I kind of, I guess, as the key kind of leading industry body in the space, Blockchain Australia has a wide variety of members. So I guess you guys get to aggregate all of those problems <laughs> facing crypto type of businesses. I guess what are some of the key problems that you're seeing um, members of Blockchain Australia come through and, and um, yeah, I guess ask for help with? Yeah, well, I guess... Um as you say, it's, it's over a very broad area and to, to solve that, well, to help solve those issues, we've uh, created five working groups. Um, they include uh, tax, um, digital assets, cyber is Web3, and what was it? Digital currencies. Oh, digital currencies, of course. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so our members get an opportunity to work through those uh, problems that they all face together um, as a community um, and respond as a single voice uh, to government submissions um, to find the solutions and help provide conversations um, that will help move everything forward for everyone. Yeah, we've got a a couple of our guys at SwiftX on the, helping out with some of the DC groups. That's, some of the feedback there has been fantastic in terms of trying to drive that alignment between businesses that do things slightly differently, but getting that one voice is, is just so important for, for progression. So, Going to change gears a little bit and talk about regulatory forecasting. Who wants to keep me off on that one? We, we've obviously <coughs> we've had the draft um, Treasury submission has came out. I don't know how many panels I might try and check out after how many panels have touched on this <laughs> over, the, over the weekend, it be a lot. But I think it is quite poignant and it is an important topic to cover. I guess from a uh, challenges, challenging perspective, what are the key challenges to overcome when it comes to you know, moving towards that AFSL regime and that, that licensing regime? I let Liam kick that off, considering how much of it you've done in your career, Matt. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. There's a little bit of thing in the industry where we get a bit of a victim mentality. We go, oh, the regulation's coming, they're gonna mess with us. But like, if I wanna be a doctor, I have to go to university and I have to get qualified and do all those types of things. Same with a lawyer, right? Um, talking a little bit what Gareth said, you know, it's very straightforward. Visa has a cutoff, I think it's 2%, right? If their fraud rate's over 2%. You know, people aren't getting debanked because they're in crypto, they're getting debanked because they're crossing those lines. And if you cross that line, Visa withdraws its insurance. So theoretically, you have to make all your clients whole if they get credit card scammed. That is a minimum requirement to work with Visa. Um, talking about what Tommy was talking about, regulation is ultimately a good thing. Um, if it's rushed through, it can hurt some people. If you look at complying with the, Australian, the upcoming Australian regulation, there's gonna be a cost, there's a burden, right? You're gonna to have to increase your compliance team, you're gonna to have to probably, if you're not paying for a chain analysis or elliptic, well, you'd be an idiot, but if you're, you probably should be paying for them, you've gotta hire people who have experience in that space. Um, I remember being back in Hong Kong for a, a while and I remember, you know, BitMEX was the first exchange that did 100X leverage and very limited KYC. And I think they knew they were gonna get blown up, right? But they were the only people offering 100, X uh, leverage and that attracted a lot of people and a lot of people didn't really understand that product and I got wrecked and so did a lot of other people. But that's the cost of doing business in crypto. If you're trying to trade stuff that you don't understand, you're probably gonna lose some of your money. Um, I think ultimately, you know, look at the history of financial regulation. Let's pick the US. And then after the, the Great Depression, a bunch of old ladies in Oklahoma invested in things they didn't understand. Regulation is to protect uneducated investors from markets where they're gonna get hosed. So that's what regulation is supposed to do. It's not supposed to govern that pointy end of blockchain where we're doing privacy coins and DeFi and all that sort of stuff, but that stuff's where the innovation happens and it's never gonna be regulated and then it's slowly gonna move through the industry. I think it's really important to acknowledge, we always like to say the regulators don't understand this space. That is complete crap, excuse my language. But Interest, payments, making money, leverage, dividing all those things, it's been around for ages. In the 1950s, we didn't have credit cards and then credit cards came out, the financial institutions looked at how they would have to change stuff and then credit cards are just part of TradFi. To be honest, we handle cash and we sell things that look like security sometimes. We are just finance. I don't really believe in this dichotomy of TradFi and DeFi, like we handle cash. There are very clear rules on how you responsibly handle cash. Over time, especially if BlackRock and these ETFs come in, that boost in liquidity, we're just gonna be part of finance, right? We're just gonna be part of finance. We're gonna be a slightly different part with slightly different requirements, but you know, ultimately the way that we impact regulation is we comment on proposal papers, right, from the government. If you just sit here and complain about the regulation, like you're not changing anything. So get involved, join Blockchain Australia, get on a working group, right? Lobby your local member. Like if you feel this is important and you really believe in crypto, which I do, like get out there, get your opinion heard and accept what other people tell you you may not like. It's gonna to go to Simon. I mean, I can't remember, we were kind of debating the number the other night, whether it was around 400 registered DCEs in the space. Yeah, or was that the, number I, the that slide had? I have is 200 plus, but that right. includes 400, because 200 is above 400. My maths is <laughs> sticking with me. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know exactly the exact number, but... Um, Amy yeah, Rose won't be happy with you, mate. Oh, that was on his left, so I can't get into trouble now. <laughs> um, uh, that, that, those are the Oztrack registered ones, but that slide might need updating. But uh, overall, regulation is a good thing. And we've been crying out for regulation because it brings legitimacy. Now we have it. Is it perfect? I don't think so. I think the, the, the um, low threshold Exemptions are far too low. I think $1,500 per customer is a joke. Um, the fact that the market, and, and look, they might be, it might be a negotiation tactic, let's start here, but they're willing to go up to here. So who knows? But um, look, that's certainly something that I imagine you'll be putting, in, SwiftX will be put, you know, Adam will be put, putting together an ind individual response and all of the exchanges, a bit, um, PayPal and, and BitGet should be putting their own responses together and CloudTech, everyone, in the industry should be. And we'll put a consolidated effort um, with the dichotomous viewpoints with, within the industry, but uh, that, that is one, that is far too low, like just uh, 1,500 per customer, what happens, we're in a bear market. W w macroeconomically, 
there are suggestions, I, I mean, I don't know if we will head towards a global recession, but there are suggestions that we are still looking at a recession. Um, certainly interest rates and cost of living is, is um, going crazy. So $1,500 is pretty tiny, and that could change, you know, drastically in a vol you know, volatile assets. Um, it will cause, the, because of the expenses that uh, Liam referred to, it will bring about a consolidation. And, and that, look, that sucks for um, smaller some smaller it businesses. It might be opportunity as well, right? It's not always a bad thing, consolidation. In the e e exactly. Do we need 400 if it is registered DCs? Do we have 400 banks in Australia? No, we don't. So You're kind of going in the same direction, I think, and, in the and, moment. And, and what's more important, protecting consumers or everyone being able to oper operate a DCE? I would argue protecting Australian consumers is an important thing. And those uh, DCEs, it's like any other economic free market. Those who will survive will survive, and, and it, it is disappointing for those who won't, but maybe they'll be able to develop or bring in funding to, to meet those AFSL requirements. But overall, it's a good thing. Um, are the parameters where they need to be at the moment? Not yet, but we're working with Treasury. Um, you're on those calls. I've got a meeting with ASIC on Monday. Um, you know, where we can share those opinions and, and hopefully there'll be some toing and froing and we'll be at Parliament House on Tuesday night um, launching the Parliament Friends of Blockchain group. So getting that voice, that bipartisan approach to uh, educate our parliamentarians um, in, in a safe manner, in a non-threatening way so that they can ask, you know, there's no dumb questions, but ask questions to educate themselves uh, on, on this space. I'll throw that one to Gareth as well. In terms of, I guess, for getting through the PayPal lens, is there anything kind of that stood out for you guys in an earlier review of that of that paper? Toying between the lines, I don't know how much you can say here <laughs> um, on a panel like this, but is there anything, I guess, that stood out for you in terms of like that is something we would absolutely lobby against, or is, you know, is there any kind of um, top of mind? Uh, yeah, we sort of challenged coming into the sector in Australia to start with because we had to go through a very detailed review because there wasn't the regulatory framework. The regulatory framework gives us more comfort to participate broadly, so I won't comment specific regulatory, regulatory comment, but I'd say it's got to be fit for purpose, it's got to be inclusive. Um, <clears throat> the fact that it's here, like I said, provides that minimum standard for industry to try and meet. Um, th there was that question around consolidation as well. Like, I won't speculate on what's going to happen with this industry, but if I look at other industries that I support, when the standards have become tighter from a regulatory perspective, at the top end, it has caused consolidation because the, the big ones try and get economies of scale. They try and um, benefit from that operational execution side of their business. But the other observation was around, it does, and you said that, Tommy, it does bring opportunity. And in the gambling sector, We've seen much tighter regulations come in, some proposals to ban credit cards as an example, and not only have we seen a consolidation at the top, but there's been a lot of growth at the bottom of small bookmakers. So I don't think it's a, a negative thing. The question is how do businesses take it to heart, bring it into their platform, build good regulatory governance, and this is not exclusive to your industry. As you said, Liam, it's not, don't feel like a victim here. Good regulatory governance, good risk management is universal in business. You get those things right, and that flows through to, in our view, customer success. You do well by your customer, you minimise harm, you disclose risks, you make sure you're targeting your product at the right people. Um, if they are exposed to a higher risk product, they're very clear that that is a higher risk product. And you know, the suitability tests are there to check that people are being um, assessed at the right level. That will generate positive news for the industry, it will mean consumers who are appropriate for those products will use them, and those that are not will not. Thanks, Gareth. I guess, uh, throwing to you, Jamie, in the context of, you know, we talked about increasing competition in the market, talked about the amount of DCEs just in Australia, more specific to this market. I guess, from your perspective, what are the kind of strategies that businesses need to do to try and, like, we've got costs as a challenge, we've got the competition as a challenge. What can businesses do to differentiate if, if there, you know, there's not going to be 400 winners in this race? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point to say that there's not going to be 400 winners in this race because to acknowledge the competition around you is a crucial part of positive business, I think. But our strategy within the bear market, and I am going to relate this in the bear market, I think it depends on the attitude of your organization. 
for us, we saw it as an opportunity to build. And I think people very often throw that word around in, in this market right now, to be honest. But we have truly built in this market. We went from 400 staff to 1,600 staff. We're now based in over 50 countries worldwide with 20 million users. That's only done through marketing. And actually, our products haven't changed. There's no shame in going, OK, we've not implemented new products. Because what we did works, and the, the customers like it. We make changes for them. Just stick to what works, stick to the fundamentals, and grow from it. Acknowledging that is a really healthy place. And the rest follows. I mean, for us, you know, you can tell by my accent, I'm from the UK. The regulations in the UK and across Europe are very different now. Mm. We can't do certain things that we used to be able to do. But that doesn't mean we can't be creative and we can't outreach in different ways. I don't think, I mean, coming back to you know, the regulations slightly in, in this response, for me, we welcome regulations. Like, re regulations are a, a huge step forward for the space. And I actually disagree slightly with Liam on his point around governance. As human beings, we're, we're groomed into a nature of control. You speed in your car, you get a parking ticket. Governance allows countries, if there's not a united approach around the world, that is, individual countries to have an approach in the way in which we could operate. And you should welcome that. We welcome criticism, we welcome praise, and we work within the boundaries that are set by that governance. Did you want to go back against that one, Liam? Are you happy enough? No, I, I, I didn't really say that governance w was a problem. I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't entirely agree. Maybe I wasn't clear, but yeah. No, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I want to no talk about... Fired, no shots fired. No shots fired? OK, fair enough, Matt. It's the first opportunity I've ever given you where you haven't taken a shot back, so um, we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> um, I want to talk about education in the space. Obviously, it's, it's actually one of the key themes that I've seen coming out through, this, um, through the conference so far is to, to focus on education. and the new wave, I guess from my perspective at least, the new wave of people or investors, beginners that are coming in are a lot more, they're putting a lot more um, importance into, into invest, um, learning strategies and doing the right things. There's just, I guess, from when, we, from when many of us started, I'm sure there, there's a lot more resource, resources available. We have, we talked about podcasts now, we've got um, some great educators in the space. Australia, I think, is, is punching above its weight when it comes, when it comes to that, um, that, that space as well. I guess in terms of educating, what are the key kind of education challenges that you guys see? I might start with, with Christy on that one. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that one, to be honest. That's all right. Do you want to, do you want to throw it across? To, do you want to start with that one, Gareth? Do you want to have a chat? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think you have to understand your customer base. So when we think about our customer base and when we talk about our exposure to we see ourselves as trying to normalize what is unconventional. If you think about trading in volatile assets, it's a very small segment of the global community who actually do it, right? So for us, when we try and get customers into crypto in the US or we offer it to them, it's, it's a choice of a variety of funding instruments. We're not just giving them that as the only choice. But up front inside the app, when you go on the PayPal landing page in the US, you'll see there's a whole bunch of stuff around education. What is this asset? How does it work? How is it backed? What happens if something goes wrong? You know, there's a full um, exposure piece to the consumer, noting that it's going to be potentially a first time for a lot of these people. We've got 400 million consumers on the platform. Most of them will have never touched crypto. So if this goes global with us, then that journey will have to be replicated in every single market specific to the regulations that apply to that market. So there's a lot of work that businesses will have to do, and that journey to your point, Jamie, like localization, language, context, it all matters. You have to do that work to get people comfortable with, with the industry and what they're participating in. Um, on our side as well, we do a lot of things around risk management uh, in our risk rules, understanding the consumer context, what's their history, where have they been um, buying things. There's, there's dynamic risk analytics on every single transaction. So we're, trying to assess, is that transaction fit for purpose for that consumer, even beyond them saying, yes, I'm good for this. If they go and do something which looks excessive to us, we're going to be putting steps in place to kind of sanity check that with them. Not to say no, but just to give them an opportunity to consider or reconsider. So the education piece is absolutely fundamental. And I think it all comes down to putting customers at the center of that journey and really building UXs that, that are human and mean something to them and don't get lost in the the minutiae of T's and C's, because people don't read that stuff. They live the experience. They want quick, easy, seamless. But in the same breath, sometimes you have to reintroduce friction to make sure that it's um, given them enough chance to understand. 
I was going to pass to you, Liam, to, to, to speak to that <laughs> um, one as well. I'm going to be, it's, yeah, this time's for shots fired. Like, everyone up here, we are actually serving ourselves when we talk about education. It's self-interest, right? If we have articles about best blockchain wallet, that drives SEO, you guys find us on traffic. Like, the more education content we push out, the more the higher we are in Google rankings. You know, there's no educator like experience. If you get wrecked on an exchange, like, you learn a lot. If you guys, let, let's just do a quick survey. Who is an Australian citizen and has like more than $3,000 worth of crypto right now? Have you guys read the regulation? I mean, it's not that long, right? The proposal paper's not that long. Uh, you guys should all be reading it. Um, we can write all the blogs in the world, but if you don't read them, that's really on you. Um, we can do podcasts. The guys who do podcasts, they are very good, but they're also driving traffic and getting ad revenue, right? So education is super important, but don't just believe us because we're obviously trying to get you to our websites and to use our products. Um, you know, do your own research. There's a Would reason that that comes average, up a lot. Yeah. The average user to go and read a Treasury consultation paper, though, because I, I wouldn't agree that that is something I would expect the average user only, to go and do. It's only, you know, it's not that many pages. You don't have to read the whole thing, but you can skip through it and see the, the juicy parts. Maybe, maybe Treasury needs to start a TikTok page and <laughs> communicate more with uh, the general public. Well, I, th I think that's the duty of us, you know, to, to make the content user-friendly. And I think when we talk about corporate responsibility, it's our duty to make that digestible for people. I think reading reports, are, I'm, I'm not sure on, but I think TikTok is probably not a stupid idea. I think, you know, why not? It's, you know, the majority of our users are young people. At BitGet, we've got a new initiative, aged 18 to 35. We committed $10 million over five years just to educate in those young people. But we can't lose sight of the people at the end of that process as well. You know, there's some great people I've spoke to. There's two ladies I was speaking to this morning for a good half an hour. You know, they wouldn't mind me saying they're well into the 60s and they're loving crypto, but we can't forget about those people as well. And I think something as an organization, we've got to acknowledge that and we've done an awful lot with young people, but probably not so much people at the, the other end of the scale and we probably need to get better at that as well. I, I completely agree with that point, and uh, we, we had our, so I sit on the advisory board of the National Anti-Scam Centre um, with, within the ACCC, one of uh, the assistant treasurers, um, ways in which to tackle uh, online scams, and th that $3 billion that I was talking about, that was $3.1 billion that was lost last year from Australians. Uh, we had our in-person in meeting here, and I suggested, how come we don't, how do we partner with the Online Safety Commissioner? Why are we not partnering with them? I mean, obviously, the online safety of children and the abhorrent things around that uh, is, is vital and, and super, super important. But we also need to protect, yeah, the uh, people like my parents' age yeah, yeah. And, and whatnot who m m are not digitally native who uh, are falling victim to these uh, investment scams and, um, or love and romance scams as well, uh, be it loneliness, and, or job opportunity scams as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. Online education and maybe the government could do a little more around that, whether it is a TikTok campaign, whether it's ads during whatever programs my parents watch. Yeah. I, um, I was just going to add that, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that people learn um, so you kind of have to consider that as well, not just kind of the demographics, but mm. also the way that people learn. Some people learn through gamification. Some yep. people need to hear it, see it, touch it. Um, you know, lots of lots of different ways. Yep. And um, I think if there was, you know, perhaps uh, like a, a trusted, um, maybe registered, regulated source source of truth where people, you know, it probably should be provided by government, you know, that people can go to as a source of truth and to, to educate themselves for free, you know. And it's, it, financial education should, should be starting in our schools um, and including, including this new digital financial world, um, which, you know, a lot of the kids are playing you know, like Roblox and uh, Fortnite or um, FIFA, you know, they're, they're learning how to trade and um, you know, manage, manage, which are basically almost financial um, instruments, um, which I, I think they're learning more about those sorts of things through those games than they are getting through schools and traditional education. Yeah, it's a great point, I guess, people's 
the way people learn has changed and is constantly evolving. Like, you know, you touched on, Jamie, TikTok. Mm. Kind of sounds like a joke, but it actually is a way that people engage now and they do, that's, that is how they learn these days. Our attention spans are diminishing by the, by the <laughs> second, right? Like, I, think, um, I think as a marketer, I sort of look at it and go, you got to target your segment correctly. And the 60 year old women that Jamie's talking about probably aren't on TikTok. Um, we're never going to be mass market until my mum. I, I gave her $100 worth of Ethereum a couple of years ago just to see that she could kind of understand. And within two months, she'd forgotten her password and didn't write down her seed phrase. So that $100 is on a treasure, which I'll never get back unless I reformat it and then I'll lose the money. But, you know, ultimately, people who are not crypto native don't really care about crypto. They want to use your experience, right? So the apps, like what Jamie was saying, UX, UI, and what uh, Gareth was saying, like, ultimately, you don't really give a shit. Like, you want to log in, buy your stuff. It's safe, it's secure, you know what you're doing, it's very easy. And it's blockchain rails at the back end, right? Mm -hmm. That's what people want. You don't want to make the friction so hard that 90% of the world's population can't figure out how to buy Bitcoin. It's funny, it reminds me of um, during the digital economy panel we had here yesterday, a, a point I forgot to raise is, is exactly what you're saying. When, when the technology becomes ubiquitous, that, that's actually when you've won. And uh, we were talking, in the context, for the context, we were talking about it, uh, and ANZ were on that panel, it, and he was, Harry was the one who actually raised it, that they believe, and I firmly and I believe, and I'm sure everyone here probably believes, that blockchain technology will be the underlying infrastructure for financial markets of the future. And uh, I, I used to work in spatial technology. That's my um, technical background. And before Google Maps existed, and we used to do a lot of navel gazing and, and be like, oh, this technology is so cool. Why doesn't everyone give a shit about it? And it's like, it's no one, the average punter does not care. And they're not into it, but they want to know how to get from A to B, or they want to know where things are located. So then it becomes ubiquitous. They're not sitting there going, oh, great, how cool is spatial technology? Who cares? And I think like when we get to that point where, um, you know, stable coins and CBDCs exist and real world asset tokenization and, and it really does start to underpin the um, financial market infrastructure. And I think the ASX did a, um, a bloody good job of at, um, trying to innovate uh, what they were doing in the mo moving from the chess system. It didn't work, but... Digital asset. Yeah, 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 yeah with digital asset holdings and digital assets. So they had a really good crack at it and, and sometimes innovation doesn't work, but the, you know they've spun out into symphony. But I think... I think like when we get to that point, hopefully we have enough self-awareness to realize that, oh wow, it has become ubiquitous, maybe we won that battle, and maybe it's not everyone is trading Dogecoin, but it's, um, you know, it's much, much broader than that, and it's much deeper than that, and, um, and that's what the technology provides, and the innovation that is taking place in the crypto space is what is gonna underpin the future of that uh, yeah, infrastructure. I was, just to support Simon's point, right, like who's got a Facebook account, can you put your hands up? How many of you know what language Facebook's coded in? Yeah, so like you pretty much all have Facebook accounts and that was like three pairs, it's in PHP, not that anyone cares. But you don't care, you don't need to know that it's in PHP to use Facebook, right? That's, that's where we wanna be. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's actually a really good analogy to use to try and tie the two together. People really don't care, they just wanna press the button, the button does the thing. That's, that's what, we, what we try and get from the product side of things. Let's finish on a positive note. We've kind of talked through challenges. I think we did pretty well to navigate those challenges and give, even start solutioning, which is, uh, which is quite, quite good. With challenge, obviously, comes opportunity. So I want to talk about, I guess, the opportunities. We've, we've talked about moving towards a regulated market, especially here in Australia. We're, we're going there. It's a, it's a, it's a question of, of when, not if, at this stage, which is actually quite pleasing, I think. Up until the last, I would say the last couple of years, even maybe, in, maybe even since this year, people were still unsure whether this market was going to be a long-term sustainable market where that, that does get regulated and, and licensed. So, hooray, we've kind of got we've we've got got through that boundary at least. I guess um, I might start with you, Liam. What what I guess are the the opportunities that that come from those that new world market where we are regulated? Um, is it all right? Can I go last? I think I, I feel like I've overshared, or I'm taking more than my share, so start with other guys and then I'll, I'll come at you. All right, I might start with you, Jamie. Yeah, I think I, I touched on it earlier around the building market for us. I think with the withdrawal of, of, of exchanges from certain countries, that's provided opportunity for me and us as a company. 
I think as somebody that's in charge of growth and, and operations and marketing, we've seen great results where Binance and Bybit have pulled out. And you know, you probably shot that I'm, I'm naming these companies, but we're honest, we're truthful. That we provide a service where others don't. Uh, and for us, that's put us in a great position. We've gone from outside of the top 10 to a top five centralized exchange. More users are coming on board every single day just by providing what we provided in the past and marketing, upscaling the way that we do it in the right way has been great. What I've touched on everything, I think I've been quite positive on this panel, to be honest, around the way in which we operate, the way in which we want to engage with, with governance and regulators and people, because nothing's changed for us. When you look geographically in some areas of the world, let me, let me talk about Turkey. Forget about the price of Bitcoin and all charts right now. Talk about the amount of users interacting within the crypto space. Turkey's at an all-time high in terms of daily average users right now within the crypto space. Mass adoption statistics are through the roof. Yep. As an exchange, as a body that works with people, that helps them buy, sell, and trade assets, we're not in a bear market. The bear market is purely on numbers of the charts that you see. So for me, I'm ultra positive. The organization is ultra positive. We can't wait to be regulated, to be honest. We want to keep driving forward and keep stealing the market share from Binance and Bybit. Anything to add to that one, Karis? I think the industry's got, like I said, a, a really positive future ahead. Um, our view is stable coins and CBDCs will be a fundamental building block of that to bring the masses to the table. Uh, use cases outside of volatile trading as well. Healthcare, social services, digital asset, ticketing, there's all sorts of things where, for me, the exchange is in a really nice position to be the, the pipes, the core infrastructure that powers all that stuff. You're not going to be making you know, supporting people with high volatility trades, it's going to be huge amounts of volume, transactional volume going through these stacks. You become like a Telstra for cryptocurrencies, right? And you become the plumbing, the pipe work, and there's, there's good money to be made there, but it's not as... Um, my news feed today is still popping up with the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum or assets, and I don't think that is the future, because it doesn't include enough people. Most people don't care about that stuff. But all these other use cases, and that's the exciting thing for me, if the industry can land and put out all that intellectual horsepower into those use cases, it's got a really bright future. Yep. Liam, I'm coming back to you, Matt. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't finish, disagree. Finish with, with your comments. I don't disagree with anything that everyone said, but like, uh, I do probably have a caveat around stable coins, right? There's four big banks in Australia, everyone knows them. Two of them have stable coins. Where can I buy the National Australia Bank stable coin? Um, they've done a couple of cross-border trades. Um, that's about it. They're probably waiting for regulation. I think if NAB's, if NAB's stablecoin was on BitGet, well, of course you would buy it, right? It's backed by a bank. It's a little bit different than Tether, which is backed now. But go back to the beginning of Tether and read all the controversial articles about how well um, backed Tether was, right? If the banks were in this space, that, that would help. I ultimately think everything is, looking, is starting to look good. Right, there's green shoots. If you're trading, you can see green candles. Let's put that aside. It doesn't affect the mass market industry. ETFs are fundamentally a good thing. That's gonna allow people like my mum to put pensions and stuff in. Um, my prediction would probably be, you know, I think amortized over the next couple of months, by June, we'll be out of the bull mark, uh, out of the bear. And I would say probably, it's probably gonna amortize at like 5% a month. So it's not gonna go up 5% every month, just be careful. I would say by June, if Bitcoin is in 25 to 30% from where it is now, and that's just a Bitcoin price prediction, but I think that will reflect confidence has returned to the market. So it's a good thing. I think with that Bitcoin price prediction, we might finish the panel there. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate your time. Yes.